change when I really hit the field. Undefeated chance, man, you know what's the deal. Trying to find a kid, I'm in a fail, doing drills. Boy, you just a sucker, you ain't never keep it real. Do you got my hand? I'm a boy, you tell the max. When I hang it up, they gon' have to give me plaques. Step up in the building and I only bring the facts. When I make a highlight, they gon' be like right, running back, okay? Always locked in, I don't got time to lack. Say he the best, he could take a lap. Batting one thousand when you check the stats. Boy, is you ready? You ain't gotta ask. I just really hit the bell. 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 Boy, I'm about to hit the bell. And welcome to the second episode of Take Me Out to the Podcast. I am here with Nick Geddes and Robert Husby. Nick, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Nick is a second-time guest, and his first appearance on Take Me Out to the Podcast, Robert Husby, fellow Dodgers fan. How are you doing, Robert? I'm doing well as a fellow Dodgers fan. <laughs> so I just want to start this off with, uh, what's the weirdest baseball game you've ever watched? Oh man, that's a tough one. Um, probably the Astros and Dodgers uh, World Series game. I think it was game. I want to say it was game. It was a game six of the 2017 World Series when the uh, it went like 13 or 14 innings and the the Dodgers had like a four or five run lead. Pretty sure it was game five. Was that game five? Yeah, yeah it was I, game five. I, I try not to remember that series too much, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, just that one, the back and forth and then going into, I remember staying up to like one or two in the morning watching that series, that, that game specifically, and uh, they, uh, they won it late. I was like, wow, I just wasted like five hours of my night. And I was like, so, so salty over that. But it was weird because it was just like a back and forth the whole, the whole game. And yeah, that, that game was a mess. I think for me it's game 162 of 2011, the Rays-Yankees. Still the greatest game I've ever seen, probably the greatest game in Rays history. Um, You know, Rays are down 7-0, and the playoff hopes were on the line, and we end up coming back all the way. And Dan Johnson, unbelievable in the ninth inning. He hit hit one down the line, and it was was foul. It it would have been a home run foul, and he hits it in the same spot, somehow pulled it around the foul pole. Uh, And then Longoria, you know later in the game ends it and I think that was I mean definitely weird the way it happened but in still probably the best game I've ever seen baseball is a weird sport and weird injuries happen in weird sports Giancarlo Stanton outfielder for the outfielder for the New York Yankees is he, he strained his calf correct yes uh, yes so he's he's questionable for opening day right now also Luis Severino Tommy John he's out for the entire year James Paxton, he's also out until realistically middle of May. How does this impact that Yankees that Yankees um, team as a whole? I think for the Yankees, it impacts them a lot. But we saw last year they were able to piece it together a lot of things, and they got really good contributions out of uh, Gio Urshela, uh, Mike Talkman, Cameron Maben, among others. And I think they're going to have to rely on, rely on those guys again. And, I mean, this is the Yankees, and they'll find a way, and they have the players in other spots so I'm not overly concerned about the Yankees, but you know you want that you'd obviously ideally want them to be healthy, and you know you're looking at a super team potentially when they're all on there, and it'd be a shame, you know, as a Yankee fan to say what if if we had everybody together, what would it look like? Yeah, I, I like that point that that Nick brought up there about you know the fact that they were able to pull through all those injuries. Obviously, they'll have Miguel Andujar uh, back for this season. Um, that was a big loss last season. Uh, guys like Urshela, guys like Talkman, just stepping up last season was a big, big thing for them. Um, as far as Stanton's injury, I think that's a, another big loss. But, you know, he was out a good portion of last season too. And I think he's on a real short leash with a lot of Yankees fans with that contract. Mm-hmm. And he's got a prove-it season, and he's already off to, by by no fault of his own, but it's, you know, he's already off to a bad start to this season with, I'm sure, a lot of Yankees fans, so that's a big thing, too. And I think Severino's injury, to me, is the bigger deal, because I think they were really relying heavily on him this year, because after Garrett Cole, it's a lot of uncertainty in that rotation, because James Paxson is not coming back to probably at least May. Uh, Tanaka has not really been the Tanaka we saw when he first came into the league. Tanaka's 100% a coin flip. He'll either mm-hmm. go yeah. he'll either go nine shutout or give up four runs in within throwing three outs. It's yeah. insane. And, and I think J.A. Happ, I believe he's the three currently, and then you're going to have to, and Domingo Herman's not going to be in that rotation. 
uh, for the foreseeable future. So you're relying on Jordan Montgomery to step up in his abs in their absences, and, and maybe Louis Sessa, Jonathan Lewisaga, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's I I have a hard time seeing how that's going to play out. Uh, but obviously, I mean, Paxton will be back soon, so that should help. But, we, but again, and James Paxton, are we going to see James Paxton from the Mariners or are we going to see James Paxton from last year? Because that's a big difference, and I think he's going to be on a short leash if he comes back and he's not the Paxton that they acquired. So where do Yankees finish? Are the Yankees, are the Yankees still the favorites in the East? I, I, would, I would think so, yes. I mean, their only other competition really in that division right now was probably the Rays. You know, they had a great season last year. Um but, you know, I think the Red Sox just, they're going to drop off so hard after losing bets and, and even losing David Price. I mean, it's just a team that really took a big hit losing their star player. So I, I really think the, this is still the Yankees division to lose, even with the injuries. Obviously, it's going to depend on how the rotation pitches and how the players step in for Giancarlo Stanton. But yeah, I mean, it's I think it's still their division to lose. Yeah, I think it's a two-team race for sure. Uh, I don't think Boston's going to be in play as much, especially, I mean, Chris Sell just went down with pneumonia, we, we heard last night. So they're not going to have David Price, so now you're looking at your ace being Eduardo Rodriguez. Erod had a fantastic year last year, but yeah, yeah. Well, let's 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 talk about these injuries a little more. Let's see, with, with all these players out, the teams are obviously going to need to call up some of their prospects to, to get into those big league games. So that's, that's, that's what we're going to be focusing on today a lot is, is the prospects. So let's keep it with the Yankees for right now. Who is the, the, the Yankees prospect that you think is going to have the biggest impact in 2020? I think it's going to be Clark Schmidt. Uh, we just talked about the Yankees pitching issues, and Clark Schmidt is their highest-ranked pitcher right now on the prospect list, and he is probably the closest to getting a chance to come up. And he pitched to a 3.47 ERA last year, so he showed a lot of potential. And I think Yankee fans are excited about him, and his opportunity has now he's – get, he's going to get an opportunity to get in that rotation, I believe, sooner than later. So it'll be up to him to to start pretty well, I think, in AAA, and he'll get a shot soon. Yeah, um, I would think it's either him or the other uh, pitching prospect they have. Uh, there is uh, Devi Garcia. Um, he's got probably, at least according to scouting reports, he's got the best slider in that prospect pool for the Yankees. So he's going to be an interesting to, one to watch. Um, I would assume him and Schmidt might, just depending on injuries in the bullpen and into the starting rotation, I, I would assume... Uh, you'll see at least one or two of either of those guys for uh, the Yankees this year. And the biggest question mark about Davey Garcia is that he's only 5'9", 163. So if, if that body doesn't hold up, he's certainly a, a phenomenal reliever candidate. But the one thing that I really like about him is that he, he does already have that above-average changeup. And that's the one thing you see a lot of guys not having because every, everybody you see, they say that um, curveballs e- and breaking balls are easier to fix than changeups. And him already having that that plus changeup really, really brings him to that next level and, and makes it even easier for him to stick in that rotation. Another guy I kind of like in the Yankees is Michael King. He he pitches a lot of ground balls, a lot of weak contact. He's not going to be your ace by any means, but the Yankees need guys to eat innings for the first month, month and a half. Why not give the kid a shot? Um, so the, so let's stick. We say that that's two team race. The Rays. Who who do the Rays have coming up? I think the one he already made his appearance last year, and I think he'll play a bigger role this year is Brendan McKay. Um, I, he, I believe he still qualifies as a prospect, but uh, I think he's going to get his chances this year because the Rays are obviously going to use their pitchers. They're going to use a lot of pitchers, and we don't know if McKay is going to get a starting spot because we really don't know if the Rays are going to be doing the opener again or not. But I think McKay. I think his ERA last year was five one four, and his short his short time up. But that was kind of platoon or uh, ballooned rather by a, a very bad Padres outing where he just could not get anybody out. <coughs> and I think besides that outing, he was pretty solid and he showed his ability to pitch. And I can't stress that enough because there's a difference between throwing and pitching. And that Brendan McKay curveball is majestic. Yes, it is. And for a guy that sits around you know 92, 93, you have to pitch. You know he can bump it up to 96 when he wants to, but he usually sits around 92, 93. And he has good placement, and he strikes a lot of guys out. For him, it's just going to be about command. If he can command those pitches, and I think he can be really effective either as a as a back-end starter or kind of a bulk-inning guy for the opener. 
Yeah, that's that's who I would say uh, for the race too. Uh, just to give the uh, the boring answer there, <laughs> but you know he's like the fifteenth ranked prospect in all of baseball. So this is a kid that has a lot of potential, and you know you you said it all with the the pitching speed and just the stuff he's got. It's it's nasty, and I think he's going to be definitely a guy to watch for the Rays this year. Um, you know, and he's not even their top prospect. Their top prospect's not even going to show up until probably next season. That's Wander Franco, and he's the top prospect in all of baseball. So they got a they got a nice little farm system growing there in Tampa and they're already uh competed for the wild card last year. So it's a it's a nice team they're getting there. So Brendan McKay, one of the big things about Brendan McKay is that he's a two-way guy. He had a couple DH appearances last year, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Um got got a decent amount of at bats. Wasn't great in those at bats. I definitely me personally, I definitely think it's pretty easy to see that he's definitely a better pitcher than a hitter. Absolutely. But how many at bats does he get? I don't think he gets many. I think he's almost an emergency pinch hitter when you need one. But for me, I think he needs to. I think he needs to focus on the pitching because you've seen the flashes of pitching, and I think he needs to put all his attention towards that because his hitting stalled out when he got to AAA, and that's never a good sign for a prospect. And I think he'll be much more effective in that area. And plus, the Rays have a log jam at first base. I think they're they're fine over there. There's not a need for Brendan McKay to be in this lineup because the Rays have a lot of depth at the hitting. So I think McKay definitely needs to stick to pitching. And like I said, the opportunities will come because the Rays will use all their pitchers. Do you think the Rays make sure he gets to that exact, I think it's like 20-ish game started for him to be designated as a two-way player? I think I wouldn't put it beyond me for Kevin Cash to do that uh, because he's a very, you talk about weird managing. You know, you talk about the weirdest game. He's the weirdest manager in the league probably with the type of things he does. So I wouldn't put it past him. But I think Kevin's going to do what, what's best for the team, and he's going to do what's best for Brendan. And for me, I think that is pitching. So although I could see it happening, I think they're going to focus on him as a pitcher primarily. I think the main source of his his at-bats will be giving somebody a day off in that DH role, making sure maybe G-Man Choi or the, the Yoshi, right? Is that who they got, Yoshi? Yeah, Yoshi. I, mean, I don't know the, the, the announcement. I, I, don't, I don't want to butcher Susugo. his name. <laughs> I believe it's Susugo, something like that. Yeah, uh, I think maybe to give him a day off, give I just think that adds so much depth to that lineup and giving him an extra day. Also, the all teams get the twenty sixth man. It yeah. it has to be a position player. They can't they can't have an extra pitcher. How important do you think that is for for the Rays because they're they're just have to use so many players to win these games. Yeah, um, it's it's huge. I mean, you know, when you have that limitation on on you know, your, your squad and they have to use all these players. It's, it's, it's a big thing. And it's, it's going to be something that Kevin Cash has to make sure he manages well, uh, because it is a thing that he has to deal with, with his squad he's got. And, you know, it's, it's going to be a big thing for them this season. And, uh, in a season where they have to follow up a successful one last year, you know, it's going to be even more important and, uh, you know, they'll have to sort of weather that storm. So let, let's keep it in that division. The the Red Sox, obviously with the with the giant Mookie Betts trade, they got Jeter Downs, Alex Verdugo, and Connor Wong. So, how big of an impact do you expect Alex Verdugo to play this year for the Red Sox? Um, honestly, probably most of them. I I see him as an everyday starter. You know, this is his second full season, I believe. This this, is, this will be the start of his second. Yeah, full this season. will be the uh, start of his second. So. I think he's ready to make that jump. You know, he was always a top prospect for the Dodgers. He was always a guy that I know Dodger fans personally that, you know, expected to see him as one for the future. So I I don't see any reason why he's not going to be the starter of the future um, for for that Red Sox team, especially with, you know, Dustin Pedroia not really. Is he even on the team anymore? He's on the 60-day injured list. Yeah, so... Yeah, I don't think Pedroia is going to be much of a factor anymore. So Manny Machado ruined Dustin Pedroia's career. <laughs> uh, probably <laughs> keeping him out of the Hall of Fame. Maybe. That's a fair point. No, I think uh, Verdugo, though, um, you know, he's out right now with the injury, and they don't know if he's going to make it back for opening day. I believe it's a long shot. I think the Kevin Pillar signing uh, helps that because Pillar had a really pretty solid season last year, uh, ending it pretty well in San Francisco. So I think Pillar is going to play a huge role there in, in being a uh, – pretty good stopgap for Rodrigo's return. And then when you look at the out outfield, that outfield, you know, Benintendi's set in left. We know that. JB Day's great defensively, but he can't hit. 
but I have to think that they're going to want to keep his glove out there. JBJ will have one month the entire year where he's the best hitter in mm-hmm. baseball. Yep. And then the other eight months, yeah. he won't be able to hit he's, anything. Yeah, he's very Kevin Kiermaier-ish in that sense. You know, they both guys that you don't want out of the lineup because of the impact in the field. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think Verdugo will get his shot because Kevin Pilar is up there in age. There's a chance for decline. And his defense did fall off last year. And that's that's kind of that was a big part of Kevin Pilar's game. So I think Verdugo is going to step in that role when he comes back. They're going to give him every chance. I mean, listen, they traded top five player in the league for him. He's going to be highlighted. They're going to want to get that return of investment. So I think Verdugo has a big shot to perform. So, Nick, do the Red Sox have any other prospects that you see making a a big impact this year? I don't know if they're going to have many making an impact this year, but I know Jeter Downs obviously becomes, I think, their one or two best prospect in the system. And he could play second and short. And obviously, he's not going to play shortstop with Bogarts there. I think second base is a little bit more wide open. Michael Chavis is there. He started out pretty hot last year and, and you know, did not end it well. But, you know, rookie years, that's what happens. He's had a good spring training so far. I think he, he, he hit one just absolute monster home run the other day. Yeah. yeah, he's got power. He's got a lot of power, that kid. Yeah, and he's pretty versatile. So if they want to put him at first, too, if they want to, if Jeter Downs impresses so much, you can rush him up. You know, he's at that point now. He's played triple-A ball. Uh, I could see him coming up in the future. Uh, Robert, do you have any Red Sox prospects that you want to highlight here? No, that that'd probably be the guy. They only have one prospect in like all of the top 100 of baseball, so it's and he's not even due to join the team until like a couple couple more seasons. So yeah, I would I would probably go Jeter Downs, and it's funny that like one of their top prospects now is a guy that they had to trade Mookie Betts for. So you know it's it's a it's a pretty thin farm system that the Red Sox have. That's why they're in a real real tough situation going yeah. forward. Yeah, the only prospect that I see even maybe having an impact in 2020 is Bobby Dahlbeck. He's a three three true outcome hitter. He's going to he's going to strike out a lot. He's going to walk a lot. He's going to hit you a lot of bombs. Um his defense is okay enough to manage third or first base. He's he's iffy at second base, kind of like a Michael Chavis situation. If Chavis slumps or Moreland isn't really there that much, I mean, expect Bobby Dahlbeck to come up. He's going to swing really hard. He might hit it might not but he's got power in there he he might he might make a name for himself in 2020 so he's another jd martinez a little bit like not that. anywhere near as good as <laughs> I, JD I martinez. hope not for the race sake <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine having like two jd martinez in the same lineup Ooh, yeah well martinez strikes out a lot though but i mean he he also hits like a <coughs> like a machine so i'll tell you what as a race fan real quick as Looking at the state of the AL East, you know, as a Rays fan, this is good. Oh, yeah. I don't want to wish injuries <laughs> upon anybody, but Stanton out, Severino out, Mookie Betts out, Chris Sell out. Hitting the field is a good. family-friendly atmosphere. We wish for poor performance, not injuries. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and, and, mm, if, they ha- if they happen, we take advantage, you know, but we don't, we don't wish them on other players. No. I love how we don't even consider the poor Toronto Blue Jays, like... The Blue, the Blue Jays, I mean, they really just have a couple pitching prospects. They have Nate yeah. Pearson, who yeah. just throws absolute fuzz. Yeah, he, he's got an 80 right now on that, on this fastball, which is the highest you can get for a pitch. He sits in 98-101. I think he's going – I think he'll be up. He's 23 years he's old. He's got to be up. He's, he's, he's coming. He's um, – the day after – I forget how many days it, it, it exactly is before you get that extra year of service time, but what are the odds that Nate Pearson is up the day after? I would say they're pretty good. I mean, it's a team that definitely needs, like, a lot of youth injection. And that's what they're going for. I mean, they have a lot of open spaces. So it's like they're not really set in stone with that team. So, yeah, I mean, you saw it last year with Boucher and and Vlad Jr. I mean, they're already in the show. They're going into their second season. So there's definitely room for prospects on that team that, you know, they're going to be looking to towards the future to build. Yeah, I think Toronto's big issue. I mean, they have issues in a lot of places, but pitching is depth. Starting rotation is one of them. I think they addressed. They actually offered Garrett Cole three hundred million dollars. Yeah, That's I mean, crazy. They, they're going after, it. and they got Hinjin Ryu, and I think they got him for a pretty good discount yeah. on what it'll offer you. You just got to hope that the AL East is not going to be too much for him, and you're not going to see decline with his <laughs> age. But I think he can frontline that staff for the meantime. But after that, I mean, that that rotation takes a nosedive. And I don't think the Matt Shoemakers of the world are going to get it done and the Tanner Roarks. So I think Nate Pearson is definitely going to have a, a clear path to that rotation as a guy. Kind of, I think he could have a Chris Paddock impact on that team. I'll say it like that. Really? I really do. What about Anthony Kay? He's a left-handed pitching prospect. He sits 91-93, tops 95. 
but he has a good three pitch mix. The changeup is ab- above average. It could stick as a major league pitch. Um, very he has a very high floor. He's obviously not going to strike out the world. He's not going to be an ace ace, but he could definitely. I think if you get 150, 160 innings out of him with a four ERA, that's that's exactly what you want because that's better than what they got. Yeah, and I think Toronto is in a they're in a youthful state right now. They're in no rush to contend. They're taking it <clears> slow. <throat> And I think they have some, obviously they have the hitting pieces that are young and they need the pitching pieces. So getting K some reps in that, in that rotation, or even in the bullpen for a little bit, just to get his feet wet. I think that'd be very beneficial to Toronto and see what you have, because you don't want to be in a situation where you have, you go back years ago where you have Noah Syndergaard in your prospect system yeah. and you trade him for 38, 39 year old R.A. Dickey. We don't need that again. The as greatest, Toronto fan. the greatest weird Cy Young season of all time. Yeah. Well, that's a weird, that's definitely a weird one. <laughs> So let's let's take it down to the the worst team in baseball or one of them the the Orioles. They are so bad. Yes, they are. What player is going to make people come to the Orioles games next year, prospect wise? Oh man, uh, I don't think you're getting anybody into that ballpark uh, based <laughs> off of prospects. Uh, that team is in such a hole. I mean, it's such a such a weird team. Um, I have. There's like one, again, this is another team that has one prospect due up this year that's in the top 100, Ryan Mountcastle. Um, he's uh, he's a first baseman. He can play outfield. He's a, he's a nice little player. He hits well, um, you know, but he's not a guy that's going to get you through the turnstiles, and that's the Orioles' big problem. They have a, a top prospect, but again, like the, like the Rays, he's not due up for a, another season or so, so... It's uh, it's gonna be tough for the Orioles uh, this year. I, I wouldn't, I would expect them to finish close to the bottom again. Do you think they will pay us to go to games? They Do you sh- think it's that bad? No, but they should. <laughs> I, I can tell you, went to a spring training game last year when it was Orioles and Red Sox. The Red Sox put all their all their minor leaguers in against the Orioles real team, and you don't want to watch the Orioles real team play baseball. I can tell you right now, especially in a spring training setting, let alone in a major league baseball setting. So what about what about Austin Hayes? Austin Hayes is a guy that I'm personally really high on. He's a center fielder with great defense. I think do you remember the the Orioles guy who who made that like super sick like rolling catch over the wall in like the last week of the season last year? Was that him? That was Austin Hayes. He's so good with that glove. I think he could be the next Adam Jones, the next center fielder who's mm-hmm. he's obviously not going to be Mike Trout. He's not going to be anything close to Mike Trout, but he's can make an impact in that lineup and be a real leader in that clubhouse. He and plus he <coughs> the the projections for him having him hit really 270 to 280 with 15 to 20 homers and 15 to 20 steals. That'll play. Mm-hmm. That'll play especially in center field with that kind of defense. Yeah, that's going to play. That's small sample size, but 68 at bats last year with Baltimore hit 309. So very small sample size, but you have to like the return so far. And this is a lineup where you you have Trey Mancini, you have Hanser Alberto, you know, you have a couple other guys in there that are eh, okay. But like you said, if you're looking for for uh, who's going to get guy who's going to put butts in seats, it's going to be Adley Rushman. But obviously he's, he's not he's not he's not ready yet. But he's one of those guys that could that could accelerate it really quick. Can we please just get Trey Mancini to play first base? Because he looks worse out there than Reese Hoskins did a couple of years ago. <laughs> he looks terrible at left field. He's wasting so much of his value. He, he has such negative defensive value on just about every stat that I've personally looked at. Get him out of there. Put him at first base. This is the Orioles with their bad contract of Chris Davis, and they <laughs> I don't think they want to put him on the bench because of that contract. And Hey, I saw he had an opposite field home run. Uh, in spring training to open up, everybody said, you know, you may have something with Chris Davis because when was the last time you saw him hit an opposite field home run? <laughs> I actually but... saw him hit an opposite field home run last year. Yeah, and in... how'd that turn out? You know? I mean, it was it was the $2 days at the Rays Stadium. So when the Rays played the Orioles last year, uh, the Orioles came to tr- the Trop. Mm-hmm. The I two- had one of those. <laughs> you were? <laughs> Brennan McKay was playing, and I was like, well, I'll go see Brennan McKay play. It was one of his first games. So that was good. I think we saw him hit. Yeah, yeah, he hit in that game. I remember he was in the lineup. Remember Did that. we go to the same game? We might have gone to the same game. <laughs> he didn't hit. even know. <laughs> he hit for sure. I know that. Where Where were you sat? Uh, 200, 200 level uh, right behind the Rays dugout. Oh, man. $2 tickets. I think we I might that. have been close. To, we were, I, <laughs> I think know. We, they, I believe it was in July. Yeah, I think we might have sat maybe 10 rows away from each oh, other at that uh, game. I mean, 
Not many people go to Rays games, so I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> a lot of people went that weekend. That was a. That's yeah, a, it was a lecture for an Orioles game. You know. <laughs> I mean, if two dollar tickets, that's practically paying you to be there. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you get to see one good team. What's the best food in the, in the in the trop? Cool. I mean, is the food even good at the trop? That's the question. I'm here. a sucker for that macaroni grilled cheese. That's that is that's a good addition to the trop. I will say that. But then again, I'm not paying. I think it's like eleven or twelve dollars for mac and cheese. No, Ugh. I'm not doing it. No, that's a that's a scam. Yeah, I mean, I keep it simple: <laughs> hot dog, cracker jacks, peanuts. I keep it in that. I keep it in that range because, you know, you start you'll start adding up to almost twenty dollars if you start getting stuff like that and a drink and everything. It's kind of ridiculous for a Rays game to be selling that much. Yeah, so the Rays they made the wild card game last year. They they absolutely spanked the Athletics, but. I just want to highlight the the performance of a certain athletics pitcher in that game, Jesus Lazardo. Three scoreless innings in that wild card game. He's a big time prospect. He's a lefty. He throws ninety eight ninety nine. He's got a disgusting breaking ball. A pretty good pretty good changeup. So, I mean, he does have some injury questions, but if he can stay on the field, what what does he look like? Um. Yeah. It's he's a nice prospect. Um. Again, you're talking top 20 prospect here um you know and he's he's a guy that can uh, contribute to the A's the A's need that I mean they need they need a lot of pitching like that so um yeah he's he's probably going to have a big season for them if they decide to you know use him uh, a good portion of the season so I think uh he's going to be probably indispensable for them I mean they really they really need a a good solid pitcher and you know he can be that guy yeah, he, absolutely electric stuff. No, no doubt about it. He showed that even in the wild card game coming out of the, in the wild card game coming out of the bullpen against the Rays. I mean, as a Rays fan, when he came in, I thought, okay, we're not getting hits on this guy. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what role he plays because his stuff is so good, his fastball wise, that he he kind of looks like a closer for me. If he can if he can start to command it though, he can he can probably get a spot in that rotation and that is definitely a rotation that needs it because Oakland never usually has that star in their rotation and I think Lazardo could be that if he finds his command. I think they'll I think they'll definitely give him a chance to be a starter out of the gate. But obviously if if the command issues start to kind of pop up again, if the if the the health isn't quite there, I think we definitely see him as sort of a the a multi-inning guy right in the middle of that that athletics bullpen, which is just absolutely lethal. You have Lou Trevino yeah. with that devastating cutter. Liam Hendricks. What a year from Liam Hendricks last year. What about AJ Puck? 6'7", absolute unit, big lefty. Throw, a, lot, a lot of Randy Johnson comps, just because he's so tall, that big fastball slider combo. He's actually, uh, Randy Johnson was actually at athletic spring training talking to AJ Puck just because he saw so much of himself in him. What, Robert, what do you see from AJ Puck this year? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're getting the nod from, like, a legend like Randy Johnson, that's that's pretty uh, pretty good confidence in you. So um, he's another guy that, you know, can, they can add to that rotation, and, and he can contribute for them all season. And, you know, they're, they're, like you said, they're starting to get a little bit of a nasty bullpen. So, you know, if they can continue to grow that pitching, I mean, that can be definitely one of their strong suits and what can help them start finally being a competitive team. Um you know, in their division. You said finally being a competitive team. Put some respect on Matt Chapman's <laughs> name. He is the best defensive third baseman in baseball. He's a real good hitter. They made the wild card game last year. Yeah. It, Put it, some respect on Matt Chapman's name. Yeah. But no, I think the A's, like I said, they don't have many guys in the front line of the rotation. No, who's, who's, your, who's their ace this year? Manaya? It's Sean Manaya, but Sean Manaya was really good last year when he came back from injury. Really good. I think he's one of my breakout guys this year. I think Siri puts it all together. Whether he becomes the front of the rotation guy, like he could be, I don't know. But there's yeah, also I don't think I don't think relying on Mike Fires as your, as your number yeah. two or your number three is exactly <laughs> I mean, the way Frankie to go. Frankie Montas will be back. I mean, obviously he was really good last year before the PED stuff. We'll find out if that played a part in what he did. Uh, but Frankie Montas, there's some potential there, and like we said with Lazardo and Puck, some nice young arms for the A's for a team that I think is ready to compete now. Uh, they probably need some more veterans in that rotation to really to really make a crack at the World Series this year if we want to get that far because their lineup is is a really that's a really good lineup and they have a division where they're easily the second best team and they'll be competing for the wild card. The only real issue I see with Puck is that he he has had a high walk rate in the, in the minors so obviously if that continues to be if he has a double digit walk rate you you can't really have that out of a starter 
But even if he's in the bullpen, mm-hmm. a six seven, that like almost sidearm delivery, throwing ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety nine, that's that's lethal. Yeah, and I think it's a common theme with all these prospects is command, and that's that's so hard. And when you have a guy that throws that hard, you know, like I said earlier, there's a difference between pitching and throwing. And they have to find that balance of throwing 100 miles an hour and commanding it because that's gonna di- that's gonna differentiate if you if you pan out if you don't pan out. We see so many guys come through who throw who throw cheddar, you know, and they just they can't hone it and their careers end shortly. So I don't think that's gonna happen with Puck because his delivery is very unique. And I think that's gonna make him stand out and it's gonna be really hard for hitters to adjust to. Plus, he doesn't just have uh, an insane fastball. That slider is just mm-hmm, absolutely sure. disgusting. But in order to win that division, they need to go, they need to beat the Astros. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I don't I don't foresee them doing that. I think the Astros, you know, take all take all the the noise around, uh, away from them. These are these are great ball players, and I think they're going to show that regardless. And Mike Fires is just going to unload on that Astros team. I'm sure he'll be throwing. <laughs> they'll they'll, they'll be a, I'm sure they'll be a, when they meet. They, I think they're the first series, right? They meet up. No, the the Astros and the Angels. Are the oh, first Astros series. and Angels. That's what it is. Yeah. So if what, there's not a brawl between Mike Fi- when Mike Fires oh, pitches will be. against that's the what, Astros, I'll yeah. be so disappointed. That, uh, there definitely is going to be at least one game where they fight. I'll be watching Absolutely. that game. I don't care if I'm in class. I'm watching that I, game. I need Rob Manfred to like be a smart businessman for once and put the first <laughs> Astros game on national television. I need to see it. I need to see it. I want to see what happens. I think it almost has to be. Yeah. yeah. It won't be, but you know, I think we need to. We'll Rob, probably Rob Manford making a smart decision. Who who would have thought? <laughs> it's not going to happen. No. He already he already he already failed in the spring training. I think we should have <laughs> probably should have seen Garrett Cole's debut. How are there Garrett Cole, Max Scherzer, and how are their aces pitching in spring training and they're not televised? How are spring training games not televised? That's insane. I mean, when you go to Garrett Cole, this is the Yankees. This is the Yankees, and this is the most <laughs> expensive pitcher ever. You don't think all these Yankee fans the are going to watch? Yeah, are you a, kidding to me? To me, that's free ratings. You I wanted to watch. Yeah, as baseball fans, you want it, you'd want to see what Garrett Cole's going to do, mm-hmm. just even for an inning. And guess what? He lit it up, like we all knew he would. But I would have liked to see it. It'd be rather pretty than cool hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> pretty cool if I could have seen him in a Yankees uniform, yeah. not on Twitter. It all goes into the spiral of how baseball, you know, can't market itself. But that's a story for they blacked out. All of Canada from watching Blue Jays games. That's so dumb. Are you kidding me? No. Are you kidding? An entire country. I'm not surprised. It's so stupid. I know. So, so back to the Astros. <laughs> what what prospects do they have? I mean, Urquidy pitched lights out in the World Series. Five innings, no runs. Who who else do they have? Who who do you guys have making a real impact on on that Astros team in 2020? Um. Yeah. There's a there's a nice player there. His name is. Uh... What's his name? Trash Can, I believe is his name. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I'm done. I'm done with the. Uh, I'm done with. Uh, I'm done with doing that. All right. Uh, no, uh, Forrest Whitley. He's uh, he's due up this year. Um, he's a uh, right hander with uh, with the Astros. He's actually again another top twenty prospect in baseball. Um, they've got a really really thin system in Houston, and it's no it's no surprise. I mean, this is a team that. Even with the, um, the the charges of I guess you could say their charges now the charges of of cheating, um, you know they've built themselves uh, a real nice ball club and this is what comes with a lot of success when you have success you don't tend to pick very high and you don't have um, a lot of deep prospects but this is a really good prospect this is probably their last top prospect for a while they're not picking in the first round. The next uh, two seasons, next two, next top two rounds. Yeah, the next, next two top seasons. two. Yeah, so it's it's going <clears> to <throat> be very thin for their an already thin farm. But um, Forrest is a uh, a guy that can contribute this year, and he's going to be um, you know the prospect to watch for them. And you know they're they're already adding to a a pretty good bullpen, a pretty good bull, uh, starting rotation. So. They need Forrest Whitley yeah. badly. He perform. wasn't good last year in the he minors. He went to AAA and his ERA ballooned to twelve twenty one. Now that and that, he had a seven nine nine ERA in all the levels last year. I mean, it, part of it might be due to the to the juice ball, but if every player is using the same ball, you can't really no you can't use argue. that as an excuse. It, I don't, I don't necessarily. He has to take a huge step forward in AAA this year. In in my mind, to even be considered to oh, yeah. to get and, called up, and I said they need him because Verlander is not getting any younger. 
Zach Grinke is not getting any younger. They lost Cole. We've lost yeah. Cole. We've seen Lance McCullers injuries. We He's an unknown commodity still. I want him to be good because he's just such a good Absolutely. guy for the community, but... Will he is he is he healthy enough to sustain? He's never thrown more than 120 innings, I think. Mm-hmm. So I mean, and you know they their their rotation did lose Wade Miley as well as well. You know you lost a quality guy that can eat innings and he, he threw had, over 180 innings last year. I yeah, think, right? you're gonna miss that. And I think Forrest Whitley, like we said, the price of being a really good ball club is you don't you don't have the top prospects anymore. I think the Astros will take that because the Astros for years acquired all these prospects and good on their scouting department or just luck of the draw because they picked so high all their prospects panned out and i think um, looking for another guy in their system he's not a prospect anymore he's had some reps but it's kyle tucker i think he's going to be leaned on heavily and i have not liked what i saw from him so what i've seen he's been like a quad a player in my opinion for the last couple years very strikeout rate high very high but he is a guy he can hit home runs and he has nothing left to prove in the minors so at this point it's sink or swim Another guy, really the only other guy that I personally like in the Astros system is a guy who had a little bit of service time last year in the majors, Bobby Abreu. He just shot up the minors last year. Started the year in A-plus ball, ended up making the majors. Had a 13 and a half strikeouts per inning with a .81 whip in the majors. And uh, another thing is his, his fastball sits 95, 96, can top 97, 98. He throws his slider more than his fastball, kind of like a Patrick Corbin type deal. But unlike Corbin, who throws 90-91, Brian Abreu is throwing fuzz. Mm-hmm. I mean, in that kind of elite arm in the bullpen, he has a curveball. He has an okay changeup. So I don't really see him making the rotation unless, you know, the, the, the injury gods rear their ugly heads. But he's he's a reliever. He's a stud reliever. And the Astros are going to have the pitching. They're going to have the hitting. It just depends if they can put it together in October. Yeah, and I think the luxury of having a team like they do you know, I said that they really need Forrest Whitley, maybe not right now, but in the future. And obviously there's room for Kyle Tucker to contribute, but they have so many good players. I mean, they're, I don't think they really need any of these guys at the moment. And a lot of their really good players are in their prime or they're still pretty young. So uh, I don't think this is a concern right now for the Astros, but obviously the sanctions are going to make it pretty difficult for them. As you see the Altuves of the world, the Yuli Gurriels of the world, the Michael Brantleys uh, get up there in age. So let's let's move down a little bit more down the rankings of that division. We have the Angels, the the team with the best player in baseball, who has been considerably one of the most mediocre teams in baseball. What what prospects? I know Joe Adele is their their top hot prospect. Stalled out a little bit in AAA, but he definitely made for, made up for it with a big Arizona Fall League. Where where do you see him? Do you see him? What when do you see him being in the majors? Uh, probably this year. Um. You know, I think he's ready. He's he's probably going to be ready sometime this season. Um, you know, I, I would assume halfway through you'll probably see him up guaranteed. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, look, top prospect for them. He's he's going to be contributing to them this season um, at some point. And, um, you know, they're starting to finally try and turn around things in that team. They're spending – they spent a ton of money on Anthony Rendon, so – they're they're trying to get their hitters. They're trying to you know they're trying to build that team up, and they're going to need a guy like that. Yeah, I think he's going to be up this year, and there's room for that because Justin Upton is up there in age, and he cannot stay healthy. So Joe Adele is going to get every shot to to go right there next to Trout. And another guy in their system, another outfielder is Brandon Marsh, twenty twenty two years old at a Double A. Uh, last year he hit three hundred when he was in Double A, uh, seven home runs, forty three RBI. So I think he he'll be on his way soon. Obviously, he hasn't played in AAA yet, so he's definitely going to AAA this year. And if he starts, you know, doing what we saw last year in AA, it's not out of the realm of possibility to think that June, July, August, you know, if maybe there's an injury or two, or even if he's just performing so well, he forces the issue. He could come up as well with Adele, but obviously Adele's going to get first crack at uh, getting in that outfield. I think Adele is almost going to have to be up by the by the middle of May. Because, I mean, they spent so much money on Rendon. They they have Julio. I mean, who else did they get into the rotation? They got another guy. Um, Angels? Yeah. Well, boy. But their rotation isn't great. They're going to need to... Well, I know that. Definitely. The, the, whole, the whole MO of that Angels team this year is going to have to be... We're going to give up five or six. We just have to score seven or eight. Yeah. Yeah. And so... I think the rotation is going to be helped out if Otani can come back to pitch June, July, maybe. If he can... If he's the same Otani we saw in flashes, the uh, pitching-wise... That's going to be a huge help, but you know, obviously his bat and that lineup is going to be pretty steady with Rendon and Trout anyway. 
Um, I, I do think Joe Adele comes up early. I don't necessarily know if Brandon Marsh is going to come up very soon, but do you see Brandon Marsh maybe getting moved for a pitcher at the deadline? It's possible. It's possible. It depends where the Angels are. I We'll have to see what impact Rendon makes because although I, I love Anthony Rendon, you have to get guys around Trout. Again, this pitching has not been addressed. I don't understand. Like I get why they got Anthony Rendon. He's a, he's a generational player. The uh, easily the best position player in the market last year, but I mean you had a chance to get Strasburg or Cole. I don't understand how you whiff on both of those and then don't even get Ryu. Yeah, I think I think that was the plan for the Angels was was get Rendon and Ryu. Once they got Rendon, I think that took them out of the play for Cole and Strasburg for sure. But yeah. Ryu was right there, and I don't know if I don't really don't know what they offered. Maybe Toronto just got a better offer. Or Toronto was first. You never know. But that rotation is is makeshift at best and that bullpen i don't know about y'all but i'm not trusting hansel robles to do that again because we saw his track history before so i think there's uncertainty back there as well i mean relievers are so volatile i mean you saw what happened to edwin diaz Mm -hmm. you know 2018 puts up the best year of his life maybe comes back last year the mets i mean i saw i do you remember the game where the dodgers came back uh from five runs in the ninth inning oh yeah yeah, yeah. i watched that game live that was so sad (laughs) <laughs> if I was a Mets fan, I probably would have cried. Oh, uh, I think that's most of them since they made the World Series. <laughs> Six playoff appearances in 33 years, y'all. Woo! <laughs> God. So, yeah. so the Rangers, Um, at least when I was looking at the Rangers, their top 10-ish, pro- their top 10, maybe 15 prospects were nowhere close to making the majors. Mm-mm. Nowhere close to making an impact this year. The The best one that I found was Nick Solak, who had uh, 33 games of experience. Put up half a win. Half a, half a win and wins above replacement. Um, double-digit walk rate. He's a, he's a very powerful bat. He's very fast. But his defensive ratings don't really grade out very well anywhere besides second base. But obviously they got that big Rudin Odor contract, which I don't know why, because he's one of the most baffling players in all of baseball. Mm-hmm. I mean... They're going to have to find a way to get his bat in the lineup just because he was so productive in that short time. Uh, how much of an impact do you see Nick Solak playing? Well, first, I mean, he's been moved around a little bit now. He was with Arizona, gets traded to the Rays for Steven Souza, and the Rays flipped him to Texas unexpectedly for Peter Fairbanks. Uh, so Nick Solak, this is a much better situation for him than it would have been in Arizona, obviously, because they're set at those positions and also Tampa. So he's going to get every chance to contribute. And there was a few games last year where he was hitting in the cleanup role for the Rangers. They trusted him to put him in the cleanup role. And like you said, he performed he performed admirably last year, so I fully expect him to get a starting role somewhere on this team and he could use his versatility very well. So uh, other also um we're just going to we're just going to crap on the Mets a little more here. Let's do it. Jared Kelenic. Jared Kelenic. Mariners the stud prospect. He's he's got to come up this year. Do you see him do you think he's maybe a rookie of the year candidate this year? Uh, definitely. I mean, um, I, yeah, I, I think it's probably him or probably Gavin Lux, um, or probably, at least for the National League. Um, those are your probably Rookie of the Year candidates. Um, you know, so that is something to look forward to if you are a Mets fan. And, um, the oh, Mariner. Why did I say the Mets? You said, did you say the Mets or the Mariners? Yeah, he, he was, he was the, the Mets' yeah. best prospect and they traded him for Edwin oh, Diaz. Oh, yeah, Robinson yeah. Cano. Oh, boy. <laughs> Edwin Diaz and Robinson. That's not the Robinson Cano trade. That's the Diaz trade. Both of them were awful last year. Yeah. For Mets, the Mets are going to Mets. Mets are going to Mets. All right, so when he wins, then the Mets don't have anything to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, K- Kelenek, he is a, he's a really good prospect. Um, Five tool stud. Yes, and uh, he hasn't played in AAA yet, so I think they're going to want to see him in AAA. But like I said, this is a really bad Mariners team. They don't have many good players, so he'll have his chance to contribute. But I think as if you're talking rookie of the year front runners, it's Luis uh, Robert for um chicago i think this is, he's gonna start the year in the majors if i had to guess if not he yeah. already has the six-year contract so he's definitely starting oh, yeah the, majors. the guy was unbelievable last year in the minor leagues 32 home runs 60 i think it's six years 55 mil the the, the white Sox offered Steel. him Steel. but the the mariners also gave out a big a big contract to a guy who'd never played a major league game first baseman evan white who's got a lot of cody bellinger comparisons because scouts say that he can play gold glove defense at first base but he also played center field for Team USA. And for a guy of that magnitude, uh, swings a big power bat. 
uh, he hit a ball at the All Star Futures game last year, one hundred twelve point two miles off the bat. If, if that ball were hit in a major league game, that's in the top point five percent of all batted balls. So the, the power there is incredible. The only real issue with him is the injury history. I think he only played in like. 90 something games last year but this might just be my love for cody bellinger and the way he plays talking but if if evan white is anywhere close to cody bellinger that's that's huge for a mariners team that doesn't have a lot to play for yeah and i think he's a first baseman correct and uh, dan vogelbach i believe is there his only competition and vogelbach was good for half the year last year and then totally fell back to the, the dan vogelbach we've all known <laughs> So uh, he's going to get his chance, Evan White. He went Vogelbach. That's a good way to put it. Great way to put it. So he'll, But, yeah, he'll get his chance. But, he, again, he hasn't been in AAA yet. So they're definitely going to want to see him in AAA for they've, sure. They've already given him the $24 million six-year contract. He's, he's starting the year in the majors. Whether that's good or bad for him, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I think the Astros did something similar with Derek Fisher a few years back. So Yikes. Yeah. Derek yeah, Fisher. Yikes. That's a name I haven't heard in years. Yeah. You're not talking about the Laker one, that's for sure. <laughs> the good one. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, even if he, even if the the Mariners really like Vogelbach there, I mean, he could easily go to the outfield. Mitch Haniger hasn't been the same guy since 2017. No, he, what a whiff by the Mariners not trading him then. He ruptured his testicle. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. I didn't know that until I was reading up on Mitch Haniger, and I was like. Wow, he ruptured his testicle. Maybe that's why he was so bad last year because he was a really good player before. So swinging with one, <laughs> swinging that's with one. It's hard to swing with two. <laughs> so um, speaking of speaking of the White Sox, Luis Robert, the other guy who's had a big contract before even making a start, just elite of the elite prospect. Uh, but, uh, I remember um, Eloy said he was going to be the next Mike Trout. Uh, so they also have two club options for 26, 2026 and 2027, making the potential deal $88 million over eight years. Um, he does have an aggressive swing approach. The only tool, he has 70 grade tools across the board, which is like very, very above average, uh, except for his contact. I mean, how, how does Luis Robert play this first year? Um, well, there's a lot of pressure on him. Um, so, you know, he, he's got all the tools, I think, to really be, what people say he is and i think he's got the you know he's he's got the the skills to really live on that potential so i think this is a huge year for him you know this is a chance for him to really make a statement as as being up there among the top prospects in baseball so he's he's got all the the tools for that and i think you know the white Sox also have mike kopech who's coming off elbow surgery um you know he was always a a big prospect for them that they always expected would be up there and this is his probably his year too where he can step into the rotation just you know the big question is is that elbow and how it looks after surgery so um you know they're gonna have two of their top prospects up this year and they're, they're gonna be an interesting team to watch uh the white Sox. michael kopech is also coming off that that post marriage vibes uh, he got married, <laughs> married to vanessa morgan the actress who was on riverdale if any of you Wanted to suffer enough to watch Riverdale. I've heard of it. Never watched it. <laughs> Don't watch it. It's so bad. It's a <laughs> terrible show. <laughs> I, but I would say about Robert, I don't want to put a lot of uh, pressure on him like Robert said. But I probably am with this statement. I think he's kind of the guy. I think he's a Soto type. He's a Soto. I think that's how good he is. He's a Soto Acuna type of guy. He can make that type of impact and become that kind of guy right away. I'm, I'm very high on him. But further down into the, not much further down, but further down into their prospect system, which is very deep, Nick Madrigal, I think, is going to have a huge impact because his spot is wide open for the taking. He had, uh, so I watched the, the game, uh, White Sox against Dodgers the other day. Nick Madrigal had two at-bats. He didn't get a hit in either run, but he just hit the ball so hard. Had such a great eye, spitting on pitches maybe half an inch off the plate. Just such, it's, it's almost like incredible to see such discipline from a, from a guy that young. Oh, yeah. I mean, he only struck out uh, 21 times last year in the minors. I mean, incredible discipline. So and, he, and he hit 311 across across the stages of the minors. And the White Sox right now, they're very, very, uh, they're not deep at second base whatsoever. Especially so. after moving Mankata to third base. I mean, that's, oh, second yeah. base is wide open. Oh, yeah. And if you can solidify that infield with Grandal, Abreu, Mankata, Tim Anderson, and Nick Madrigal, I mean... I mean, like I said, I was very high on the White Sox, as I stated in the last podcast. White so We are a White Sox stan podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. They have some 
icy players too. I want them to be good so bad. Yeah, I'm feeling I'm feeling the White Sox vibe. They deserve this too. Have, have I has my White Sox uh, cheering turned you? Uh, no, no, no. I think for myself. <laughs> I if I turn if I turn Robert onto the White Sox bandwagon, we we might have something here. Robert, I don't know if I I don't think I could draw myself to cheer for a Chicago team. I, I don't think I could. Hey, but it's not the Cubs. Though. Yeah, I was just gonna say it's at least it's better. not the Cubs. It's not the same. It's not the same. Uh, you know, it's the American League versus the National League. So, so uh, keeping it back into the Central, the the Twins. I mean, the Twins don't really have two terribly many prospects besides Royce Lewis and Royce Lewis might not even get to the majors this year. I mean, he probably will by like June, but, yeah. but what do you see from Royce Lewis this year? Yeah. Um, he's, he's a questionable one. He's still, I think a top 10 prospect, um, you know, and he's still projected to make the, the team this season, but yeah, I mean, his, uh, his ERA, his, uh, average took a hit last year when he went to a uh, triple a, it dropped down to like two thirty six or something like that. And he was up, in double A, he was up to like almost 290. So it, it's it's gone down, and that's not the trend you want when you switch from double A to triple A. Because you know if you're looking at trends, then you're looking at him making the MLB and saying, well, what happens if it drops to you know close to 200? So he's a questionable prospect, still rated highly as a top prospect, um, but he's got questions there, and he's got to prove it this year if he doesn't make the team. I think Alex Kirilov will be on this Twins team at some point this year, and quick, more quicker than not. Um, last year in the minors, he had 20 home runs, 101 driven in, 348 average. That's outstanding for a prospect. What level was that in? Uh, I believe that was all in... Um, double A? That was in double A. That was in double... That, that was in uh, 2018 he did that. Last year in 2019, nine homers, 43 ribbies, and 283 batting average in 94 games at double A. So he hasn't he has not played in AAA yet, but he's 22 years old. So I I think he'll be in AAA to start out with. The Twins have a lot of depth everywhere, so his spot is not like glaringly obvious. Yeah. But when you hit like that, I mean, he's going to force it. He's going to force the issue. He's a top 30 prospect right now in the league, and I think the Twins are going to rely on him heavily as to get some youth in that in that lineup going for him. The one big thing I do want to say about Royce Lewis. So the Twins didn't have a, another shortstop spot to put in the Arizona Fall League. So Royce Lewis said that he's going to go as a, as a utility player. And his defense is average to slightly above average at shortstop. But he played a couple of games at third, a couple, a couple of games at second, a couple of games at center field. And scouts ranked him an elite at all of those positions. So even if he's not necessarily good enough at hitting to take away from Polanco at shortstop at the major league level, he can easily, if you're a, obviously if you're an elite center fielder, you can be a super elite left or right fielder. Elite at second base, elite at third base. Does he maybe come up in more of a utility role this year? Yeah, he definitely could. Um, and I was wrong. Yeah, he actually hasn't been to Triple A yet, so that's even a little bit more concerning. Um, so uh, supposedly he's been working with um, Tory Hunter this uh, this off season so far. So that's a good guy to be around, especially as as a as a twin. Um, you know, you want to get that veteran experience that he can sort of help him out playing and. You know, that's a, a positive influence to be around. And if you can really focus on, you know, be an elite infielder like that, it definitely makes up for um, your lack of hitting ability in the majors. So, you know, he, he definitely um, can be a utility player there. He doesn't necessarily have to be a guy that you rely on straight from the start. I think his speed is going to help him because he stole 68 bags in his three years in the minors and he had 22 last year. Uh, but what's concerning about him is you want a guy like that to be your table setter for your lineup. And his on base was 290 last year and 517 at bats in the minors. That's not getting it done. And that is not going to fly uh, with the Twins going forward with Royce Lewis because this is a first overall pick. So the pressure is there uh, to perform. And I think they expected his hitting to, to continue that plateau going up. And they're going to be asking themselves, you know, what can we change about him? Do we need to change anything about him? So, I mean, that's going to be something for the Twins organization to do and for Royce himself because that is quite the drop-off uh, from what he was before because, you know, his on-base was that was always, you know, pretty good the first two years. Now his career on-base is down to 331, and that 290 impacted it so much. And so I think for a guy that you probably want leading off for your team, he's definitely going to have to get that on-base up more. So competing with the Twins for the for the AL Central is really only the white only the not the White Sox. 
I want the White Sox, but the, the Indians. So one Indians prospect that I think is very strange, Daniel Johnson, the outfielder with uh, very, he has very large tools, just absolute elite speed and absolute cannon for the arm. He hit multiple balls over 450 feet in the regular season last year. Something I want to say, um, he's a lefty. He has struggled hitting lefty hitters last year. He made a big improvement. So that, that platoon only role is not necessarily stuck to him as hard as it was. But in the Arizona Fall League, he had the highest exit velocity of any batted ball at 116.4 miles an hour. He had, threw the hardest ball from the outfield at 109 mile, 100.9 miles an hour. But he slashed, He had a 145 batting average, a 260 on base, and a 177 slug. Like, if he could just put it all together, he could be one, one heck of an outfielder. But, but will he? Can he? Um, I think he could. I mean, the 19 home runs and the 77 RBI speak for themselves and the 290 batting average at AAA. And he's also 23 years old, so he's at that point now where you think he doesn't have much to prove left in the minors. And I think the Indians, this is a, this is a lineup that has been, has been kind of taken away in recent years, and I think uh, uh, definitely they're going to have spots open. They so definitely need outfielders. They definitely need uh, outfielders. And another guy I'm looking for in their system is Nolan Jones. I think third base is is obviously taken right now with Jose Mar- uh, Ramirez. So. But, I mean, Jose Ramirez has shown uh, at least 2018, 2017, he can handle second base like a champ. Oh, yeah. He can play real good defense there. Yeah, so. versatile. But Nolan Jones, you know, last year, uh, uh, 15 homers, 63 RBIs, 272 batting average, 21 years old. Um and he did that at AAA, so I think he's going to play an impact soon, and they'll find a way to get him in there. Another, another thing with, with Bauer and, and Kluber leaving is they need pitching. And Logan Allen, who they got in the in the Puig trade with a three-team deal, um, he, he sits 92-94. He's not going to blow you away with the fastball, but he knows how to pitch. It's a great changeup, uh, good off-speed breaking balls, uh, great control. He, he could definitely easily slot into that three or four spot maybe. And just be a, a solid starter that's going to give you a lot of production out of that rotation. Yeah, and they definitely need it. I think uh, uh, Clevenger's hurt too right now, so it's a very thin, very thin uh, starting rotation for the Indians. And what used to be one of their strong stu- suits, and now, you know, taking a hit. Yeah, they're going to have to rely a lot on the the younger guys in that rotation, like um, Zach Plezak, Andrew Savali, who you saw a lot last year down the stretch for the Indians, but. Unlike most years, this is not this division is not the Indians' division anymore. There's a lot of competition. The Twins had it last year, obviously, um, and that that did not help the Indians whatsoever. And then the White Sox are obviously coming on strong. And I think their roster, if we're, if we're comparing rosters, I think they may have a better roster at this point than the Indians. And you know, you don't know what they're doing with Lindor and that such. And Carlos Santana is up there in age. And so, if the Indians come out to a really slow start, is Lindor moved? I mean, I would have said in other years, I would have said no way you trade Lindor, but Mookie Betts just got traded, yeah. so all options are on the table. The owner has already said uh, enjoy Lindor while you can. He's yeah. he's put it out into the public into the public space that they're not re-signing Lindor. He's not going to pay the money. Yeah. And so I, why not get something? For I'm him? I'm so confused by the way with what all these teams are doing with Mookie Betts, Nolan Arenado. What what are we doing with our star players right now? You have a star player. I, I don't get it. Why are we being stingy? We're you, giving money to the wrong players they're, like Bryce they're making, Harper. They're making billions of dollars, and they're not going to spend. No. No, it's, no we're it's giving so the wrong stupid. players millions of dollars like Bryce Harper. I know you love Bryce Cut Harper. Cut your Bryce Harper slander no, right I, now. I always got to get Bryce Harper slander <laughs> everywhere I go, and I'm going to do it right now. So you agreed it's slander. <laughs> you no, know, and I mean, you see, I think you see the impact of these huge contracts, too, though. Like, you know, even though I've always sort of been fond of Bryce Harper, um, myself you know definitely the contract doesn't fit the 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 hitting right now year one guys yeah, i know it's your one i know but you always you know you always get that initial backlash and i think eventually he'll be he'll be worth it but with that contract you almost have to be consistently up for mvp and he hasn't been that consistent and you know you hope he can be but because he's he's really one of those marketable guys he's got the personality he can be a marketable guy for the mlb um, but even, you know, you even see Manny Machado. I mean, it's the same thing. So, you know, it's year one, but they got to prove that that contract's worth it. See, that's my problem, though. And I told Johnny this last, pot, last podcast. Why are we paying a guy more money just because he's marketable and just because he brings... I want to know what he's doing on the field. 
uh, hit, hit did he over, help the Phillies hitting, last year? Hitting yes over no? 30 home runs. Did he help the yes, Phillies? Yes, he did. Did he help you really? Yes. It wasn't his fault every in single... In the playoffs. It wasn't his fault that every single pitcher on the field got worse. You wanted to pitch? At that money, you might as well get out there. <laughs> but let's, let's bring it back to the prospects right now. Me, 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 me and Nick will go box later. <laughs> um, for the Tigers, they have Casey Mize, 1-1 overall. Struggled a little bit uh, towards the end of last year after the, the Tommy John scare. Didn't end up having the surgery. But, I mean, he's he's got good stuff. He's obviously got the makeup. Is is he going to be durable enough to become that ace? Uh, he's going to have to be for them. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a big concern like you saw with, you know, not taking that surgery. You saw it with Luis Severino. You saw Severino not get Tommy John's last season, and already he needs it out for the season. So, you know, it's definitely a concern where, you know, you worry, is he going to need Tommy John's at some point? You know, it, by avoiding it early, is he, you know, just pushing it off it for an inev- inevitable um, injury? Okay. You know, yeah, an inevitable outcome, you know. So that's a big question with him. But, you know, he's going to have to prove he's durable with how highly he's rated as a prospect. And he definitely, you know, the Tigers need him, need a prospect like that to to hit like that. Oh, he'll, he'll be playing this year on that Tigers rotation. No yeah. no doubt about it. Because they're not going to go into another... You cannot have Jordan Zimmerman as your front man in a rotation. You just can't. Matthew Boyd is still there. Matthew <laughs> Boyd, whatever. Matthew Boyd, I'm anticipating him getting <laughs> traded, so I'm not even including him right now. He's there plans. for now. <laughs> for now, but he's not in my plans for the long term for them. But he. Oh, June K- 1st, he's gone. Oh, yeah. Guaranteed. Casey Mize, he's, he is definitely playing on this team this year, and so is Matt Manning. Who I like Matt, Matt Manning, Manning a lot. Matt Manning was really good last year in the minors. He is going to get a chance to prove himself. And like I said, consistent with that some of these curveball. bad teams. That Matt Manning They're, curveball. Oh, yeah. Damn good curveball. He, he, he throws from way over the top. It's absolutely beautiful. That fastball slider. Uh, not, no, sorry, that fastball curveball combination. Absolutely mesmerizing to watch. Oh, yeah. And he struck out, you know, 148 last year in the minors, 133 innings. I mean, the guy has strikeout ability. And I think that that's something that even Casey Mize has as well. And if you're a Tiger fan, you have to be excited about that because you got to be excited about something. <laughs> so, you know, I'm it's, looking for those two guys to contribute. And they never traded uh, Michael Fulmer when he was at full value. So is Michael Fulmer still on that team? Yes. Yes, he is. I'm disappointed in that. Let's, let's talk about another team that it's, that's just so bad in that same division, the Royals. I mean, I've got Brady Singer. He's he's somewhat lacking a third pitch to to become a a, a a solid, serviceable starter at the big league level. But you know, everybody talks about that bulldog mentality. He wants to get out there, compete. Do you see him kind of bringing bring that third pitch in, getting that changeup developed, and becoming that good starter, or does he kind of never really get that, become a back end or maybe an, an elite reliever with that? You know, uh, he's gonna get the shot in the starting rotation first. So, you know, they're going to find out firsthand if he's ready for that role or if he's come to come out of the bullpen. And, you know, uh, with a team as bad as the Royals, they, you know, have that open spot where they can kind of, they can kind of tinker a bit with that rotation. They can kind of experiment and they can say, Hey, you know, let's give this guy a chance. You know, let's see if he can come up. Let's see if he can contribute as a starter. And if not, you know, there's nothing wrong with being, elite coming out of the bullpen nothing wrong with that at all I mean that's a very coveted coveted assets right now are bullpen pitchers you know uh, having a strong bullpen shows you can go the distance in the playoffs if you eventually make them now that's obviously very far off for the Royals but you know it's something for the future that they definitely need yeah I think there are no pre- like a, like some other teams too like there are no pre- <laughs> like the Astros there are no pressure to to get these guys to come up the Royals and in, in in the flip side are in no pressure to win right now, and they can experiment with so many other things because they don't have that roster to compete. And so Brady Singer, they're going to put him in that rotation and see what he has. And I think you have to do that. It's trial by fire mm-hmm. with a lot of these prospects. And Brady Singer, he did it at Florida. He was very impressive there. He's been impressive in the minors. So at this point, it's time to see it. And Daniel Lynch is another guy. He's a lefty. Uh, he has not played above a ball yet. But he's been very good in that, and I wouldn't surprise me to see him in AAA already because he's 23 years old, and so they may accelerate the process there. So he's another guy I think that they're going to experiment to see what they have in him. But Brady Singer is the guy, and he's going to get all the opportunities. Another guy I might almost like more than Brady Singer is is Jackson Coar. He has the the best, what, probably maybe potentially the best changeup in baseball right now. Definitely the best changeup in the minor leagues. Uh, he. 
He throws mid to high 90s, so he's not like Trevor Richards, who has a disgusting changeup, but he only throws 89, so it doesn't mean anything. He's got that disgusting changeup. He's got, a, he's got a breaking ball. It's like in between a curve and a slider, but it's good. I think he really makes makes that push. I think he's better than Brady Singer this year. He definitely wow. has the potential to be better than Brady Singer this year. Yeah, it, it, like I said, we wouldn't be talking about the uncertainty of these prospects if we didn't, if we weren't uncertain about them, obviously. Yeah. So nobody's a nobody's a proven commodity. So, and the Royals have a huge need for somebody to step up in that pitching rotation because there's nobody in that pitching and that in that pitching that they have bullpen or starters that I'm looking at. Wow, we have something here. <laughs> And these are three names that we just threw out right here that, you know, have a chance to do that. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's that's fair enough. You know, I think, you know, there's there's a, a case to be made when, especially when it comes to the top teams, you don't want to prospect hoard and stuff like that. For, for a team like the Royals that are at the bottom, you know, of their division, bottom of the league, um, you know, there's a little bit more pressure on the prospects because you want those guys to turn out to be exactly what their potential is or exactly what they're rated as. So, you know, you definitely hope for that. Um, but yeah, it's all it's all a questions game. I mean, you don't know. There's guys that are rated as busts. There's guys that are rated as, you know, non-commodities, and they end up coming out of nowhere, you know, maybe even later in their career. Again, going back to Mike Talkman and going to Gio Urshela, nobody expected those guys to be you know, uh, contributing as much as they did last year for the Yankees. And, you know, they're not exactly prospects. They're like 27 and 28, you know, respectively. So it's, you know, you just don't know. You don't know. Again, it, going back to the Dodgers, Max Muncy. Max Muncy was a career minor leaguer, didn't really play much for the athletics. Dodgers liked what he had in OKC, brought him up, and now he's a guy they're they're paying good money to, and he's a solid contributor for them and a fan favorite. So you just don't know with prospects and it's all a big question until you actually see what they put on the field themselves. Yeah, it's all speculation. You know, no none of us know more than the other who's you can't tell who's going to be a good pro, who's going to be a good player or not. You know, that's the beauty of the game is it's so uncertain and nobody can tell more than anybody else who's going to be good or who's not going to be good cuz you know I mean, chances are half the guys we've we've said are going to be great, they're going to be bad, yeah. and that's just the reality of the of, of the game. Not everybody can be good, and a lot of these guys who we haven't talked about today are going to end up being the ones who really end up becoming good players. And when we do future podcasting years from now, you know they're going to be the guys we're talking about. So I think that's a lesson to be learned. It doesn't matter if you're in the top 100 or not. You have a chance to play this game because we've mm-hmm. seen so many examples. I mean, like Mike Piazza, I believe he went in the 43rd round. And he's sitting in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. You know, it can be it can be done. And that is a great place to end. Nick, Robert, thank you for joining me today on thank the you. second episode of Take Me Out to the Podcast. For other HTF content, check out Might I Add with Kyle Partain and Jessica Tuccironi on YouTube. Earlier today, Jeremy Brenner, John Whitley, and Chris Wolf uh, talked about the NFL Combine Preview. And be sure to check out our main show on Mondays. And now... Goodbye, people. Things gonna change when I really hit the field. Undefeated chance when you know what's the deal. Trying to find a kid, I'm in a field doing drills. Boy, you just a sucker, you ain't never keep it real. Do this in my hand, I'm a warrior to the max. When I hang it up, they gon' have to give me plaques. Step up in the building and I only bring a flex. When I make a highlight, they gon' be like running back. Okay, always locked in, now I don't got time to lag. Saying he the best, he could take a lap. Better than 1,000 when he trick the snatch. Boy, is you ready? You ain't gotta ask. I just really hit the bell. I just really hit the bell. I just really hit the bell.